Hello legends. In this video, I'm gonna show you the process that programmers and developers use to build production ready workflows. So what you see on a screen right now is a template that tries to replicate building in different environments. The use of environments when you're building out your workflows is actually best practice. And environments are all about sequencing out the build into different stages, into different parts where each part has a different purpose. So at a high level, the most common environments are local development, then integration, then testing, then staging, then production. In a recent post on my school community, I actually used the analogy of, imagine you own a bakery and you wanna introduce a new cake into your lineup. Well, if you were to try and replicate all those five stages where production is you're actually selling the cake in your bakery to real customers, you'd actually probably start somewhere where you're first in your kitchen, you may be looking for some recipes, you may be just experimenting by yourself. And when you're at a level where you're thinking, okay, this is pretty cool, you might then ask some of your family members, maybe your mom has been making cakes for ages and she's got a special technique for whipping up the cream. Or maybe you have some family recipes or maybe you have a shared cookbook where you can pull out more little tips and tricks from. Now the next stage is you're gonna be focusing on presentation and flavor. Maybe you wanna make the cake look really plump. Maybe you wanna have these really nice effects on the side of the cake where you have to have this frozen cream. After you have the presentation and flavor locked in, you might then wanna serve the cake to your family at a small family dinner. So you're actually kind of testing it out with people, seeing what they say, what feedback you get. And then finally, after everything works out at your family dinner, you fixed your production method, all the cakes are coming out, the same consistency, the same flavor. Now you're ready to bring them into your lineup and then sell them in your bakery to real customers. Now, what I think a lot of us do, and this is me included when I was first building out workflows, we kind of just try and build with the end in mind. Because we don't come from programming or this kind of technical background, we don't know the actual best practice for staging out the build. We don't know how this system works. We don't have a process for it. So what that usually means is that when we come onto NAN, we're actually trying to build the final version of the workflow straight away. So let's say we're trying to build an agent that can help us classify customer support tickets. We need some way of sending the uh, information from Zendesk, for example, our customer support tool into NAN. So we need some webhook. Then once we have that data, we might wanna build an AI agent that can classify that information for us. And then we know that in order to respond back to that webhook, we need to get a respond to webhook node. And now whenever we send some information in from Zendesk, like a uh, sentence to classify, we run it through our AI agent, and then we can send that information back to that API call from Zendesk. But one of the issues that we run into now is, well, in order for us to actually test this system, we actually have to run it on real customer support tickets because we have to get the data in from somewhere external to this workflow. And then we're actually expecting to send that data back out to that external workflow. But our first step should actually be local development. We should figure out how to run this AI agent within the NAN canvas by putting in some variables from the canvas. So that might mean that instead of using the webhook, we kind of bring the webhook stuff down to here. And we know that, you know, we have to keep the start and the end looking like this when we're building out our test agent. So that means, okay, how do we kind of replicate the same system? Well, maybe instead of using a webhook, we'll just use a chat trigger to send some information into the agent because all we really wanna do here is send some kind of sentence, have the agent process that sentence, and then maybe on the other end, instead of going to the webhook and going across to Zendesk, maybe just wanna use a set fields node because here we can actually just define the output of what we get from the AI agent. And if we can define the output here, we can kind of capture that, then we can very quickly and easily kind of interchange it into our respond to webhook node. So what we've just done is that we've successfully separated out the production stuff to the very bottom. And we're not just taking it out of sight and out of mind. We know exactly how this workflow has to start and how it has to end. And all we've just done is that we've given ourselves the ability to test this actual agent. So the logic in between the actual start and the end of the workflow by using variables that we set from the canvas. For this template, instead of using the chat trigger node, I've just got a set fields node where I'm setting my text to be classified as, hey, I need help, my product is broken. And then just for my own reference, I've got environment equals development. So then from here, I'm plugging it into our AI agent. And then over here on the output, I'm just gonna be setting the classified text as the output. So let's run this workflow and see what we get on the other end. So I'm gonna click on execute. There we go, we have our agent process the actual text to be classified and then our output is technical. So this means we've successfully classified the text from our agent and we've defined it as being a technical support request. So the great thing about the development environment is that you actually give yourself permission to try and test the workflow, to try and break it a little bit. 
And the whole idea is that here is, this is where you're kind of trying to get the plumbing of things going on. You're not really looking at the quality just yet. You just want to make sure that all the nodes are connected up together, the sequence is in the right order, and that you can kind of input some variable and get some variable on the output. So this is all part of development. I'm choosing my AI model. Maybe I'm coming into here. I've got my input defined as the chat trigger node. Maybe I want to set a system prompt. And this is where I define the role of the agent, the specific outputs that I'm expecting. And then I just run this agent in isolation until it's ready to be shared with the wider team. So our step two is now the integration environment. To remind us, integration is where we're sharing the cake with our family to get their feedback and to try and improve the cake. So in the integration environment, we're gonna be working with different people on this workflow. So if I was building out this workflow, the first question I'm gonna have is, hey, the person that's responsible for setting up Zendesk to send some information into this webhook, what data are they gonna be sending me? Or do I need to give them feedback on what data I expect? Because if I'm using the chat trigger node, I'm just sending a free text into the system. And while I'm doing local development, that actually works for me, but when I'm gonna be integrating with different people, I now wanna just start getting the right data format here. So I'm gonna be using a sticky note and I'm just gonna write here, I need to figure out how the JSON object looks when it lands over here. So that means that maybe instead of using the chat trigger node, I might just remove this. And now I might just get that set fields node. So that's why I actually have the set fields node in the core template. So now we have the set fields node. We're able to map exactly what variables we're receiving here. We can bring in multiple variables and we can plumb them all into the AI agent. Another thing that I might not know is, okay, well, the actual prompt, I'm taking my best guess right now to just define what I think it is. But really, I need to speak to the person that's responsible for the overall system. Or if I'm building this out for a client, I might put a little note here. And let's say I'm building out that text classifier agent. Well, I might just need to go to the client and ask them, what categories does this agent need to define the text into so that I can actually edit the prompt? Another cool thing that I recommend is actually using the do nothing node. So let's say I've got a bigger workflow that has uh, a bunch of different nodes, a bunch of different steps. At one stage, it actually splits off and it has an if node. So if it's true, it might take one specific route. And let's say, for example, I'm responsible for the if node and I know that my next step is an AI agent to do some more processing. If someone else is responsible for this bottom part of the workflow, I might just use the do nothing node just to represent that there is something uh, going on over here, but actually there's nothing here right now. And that means that when I actually run down this false route, I can double click this node and I can still see what data is available at this false route. So then over here, I might just have another note and I might just say, for the person that I'm collaborating with, I might say, hey Bart, like, please build out the false route so that Bart knows or I know that I have to build out this sequence of events. So once we've successfully collaborated with different people, with key stakeholders on the workflow, we're now ready to start pressure testing this. So this is where we're testing out the presentation and the flavor of the cake. So that actually means for us in this template, I'm just gonna disconnect some of these routes because now we've finished with the development environment and now I'm gonna be plugging into the test environment. So the objective here is to actually test out that the system can handle the volume of possible tickets we might get. For example, if we're receiving 10,000 requests per week, that means that this system has to be able to handle that kind of volume. And then we also have to make sure that the prompt that we're using is able to accurately classify the text. So over here, I actually have a testing spreadsheet. So I've got 20 different texts that I need to classify. And I also have the human classified um, outputs of these texts, which means that I know exactly what I need to achieve. And then I'm gonna compare them side by side to my actual classified output from the AI. And then I have a separate workflow, which I'll show it in just a second, which is gonna validate the difference between these. So if there's a discrepancy between the validation, I'm gonna get either a one here, which is accurate, or a zero, which is inaccurate. Okay, so let's test this out. Now, what we're gonna see is that we're actually pulling all those 20 requests at the very same time to batch test this. You can see we're actually firing off 20 separate API calls in quick succession. And then we have our output over here. So you might be asking me, Bart, why didn't you do the loop? Now, I didn't use this loop over items feature specifically because if I did that, it would actually regulate my API calls to like one per second, for example. I could actually, like the purpose of this is to batch it out so I don't hit my rate limits. Now, one of my intentions over here in this testing environment is to actually expose the system to the maximum use case. So let's say I've got a lot of tickets coming into my inbox and I might send 20 tickets at one time into this agent. Well, I've just tested that my rate limit for OpenAI is good enough to handle 20 relatively simultaneous API requests. If I was on tier one for OpenAI, maybe after five or six requests, I would have actually capped out and then this workflow would have stopped. 
we can now see over here that we have the classified by AI section over here. And now let's actually go across to our validation workflow and just see what the accuracy of the system was. So I've got a very simple validation workflow here. We click to execute. I pull in all the human classified and AI classified information. I compare it over here using this evaluations node where I just return a one if it's the same or a zero if it's different. And then finally, I update the spreadsheet with that information. So I'm just gonna click to execute. And now we can see that we have our validation over here. So we've got a false, 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 false. So it looks like our system, while it works and the plumbing is connected, it actually doesn't produce the desired result. So let's actually try and make this better. So let me see what model I'm using. Okay, I'm using the 3.5 turbo. So maybe that's why it's inaccurate. Let's actually choose something a little bit better. So I'm gonna to go to 4.1 and I'm gonna get the mini model over here. Okay, done. Let's try this workflow one more time. Beautiful thing is look how easy it is to actually test out this new model very quickly across those data set of 20 examples. So now they've been re-added over here. And I can already immediately see that the output of this specific model actually includes the category uh, at the very start, so a category tag, but it also includes this is a technical query or this is a general query. So really, I just want the words as the output, not a sentence, and I don't wanna have any like key value pairs over here. So surprisingly, the 4.1 model gives us a different output on the other end. Now, I just wanna emphasize that the validation section is actually really important because we've just got 20, uh, 20 examples over here which is very quick to visually see uh, what's going right, what's going wrong. But if we were running this through a thousand examples, well, we wouldn't be able to just very quickly by eye do this in a reliable and consistent manner. So that's the purpose of this validation. So let's actually rerun this validation as well. It's gonna overwrite those previous variables. And as expected, we have uh, even more failures. So fail, 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 this is a fail as well. We have heaps of failures over here. So now my second step might be to come into here and actually change this prompt. Okay, so the prompt is minimal and that's probably why it's not really working well. Okay, so I've updated my prompt. Let's see if this is any better. Let's run a system again. Super, super easy. Just got to click the button and now we're running through the 20 examples. That's really cool. Our rate limit is still fine. Okay, we've overridden the examples. So far, it seems like they're pretty cool. We don't have the, you know, that this is things or we don't have that key value pair stuff. So that is pretty promising. Let's run it through our validation system. Oh, wow, look at that. Now they're all ones. So actually the accuracy is 100%. So this just means that we've been able to get our system to match the exact human classifications for our testing cases. So now I'm actually happy enough to put this into the live environment. So all I need to do there is just disconnect some of these routes. There we go. And because at the start of the workflow, I knew that I needed webhooks at the very start and the end, I can just plug my system into the production stage. So to try replicate a ticket coming in from Zendesk, I've just written a simple script over here, which is gonna send this text, which says, I need help, my product is broken, across to our workflow. And then we're gonna be receiving a response over here, and we're gonna see what the classification is. So to turn that on, I'm just gonna flick down here and start the workflow from Webhook. I'm gonna turn this on to be receiving events. And now in cursor, I'm just gonna fire off this API call. We sent the text across to NAN, and now we have the response, which is technical then we can see our workflow executed. So what we just did is that we actually skipped this staging environment and we went straight to production. So in some cases, depending on the workflow that you're building, the complexity of the workflow, the risk associated with the output that you need to produce, you might be able to kind of skip through some of these. It's really dependent on what you're doing. But in my stage, since I'm actually gonna be running to real live customers, I actually also wanna look at this staging environment. So how do we use the staging environment over here? Well, I would actually still want to receive these real life events from the production. So I could still build my Zendesk system to send in the requests across to this webhook, and then I can process them with my agent. But instead of responding back to Zendesk and actually impacting some change, I can just log the output, which means I can now create a new spreadsheet where I take the text that came in from Zendesk and I pin it up against the classified by AI column. And this means that I can actually run this system for a week where I'm receiving the events from Zendesk and I'm just classifying them and adding them to my database. And then I can get someone from my human team to actually do a final sweep. Because the test cases that we used here, maybe they were good, but maybe they weren't broad enough. And if we actually run this for a week in real life, we might find that we actually have more variety in the actual text. So our human can classify everything and then we can still run them through our validation workflow as one final step in that staging environment. So that's a very easy way that you can still get that staging environment using this very basic template. 
Now, one final thing that I would recommend is that if you are running this in production is not to just send this directly back to that third party tool, but rather to introduce a logging step as well. So now all I'm doing here is that before I send the information back to that third party tool, so across the Zendesk, I'm still gonna be logging that event. I'm still gonna log what I received from Zendesk and the output of the AI agent. So that I have a very easy way to see how many times my system was fired off, what the actual texts were, what they were classified as, and I can run my validation workflow as well. So let's open up this webhook one more time. I'm over in my production sheet, so I don't have anything added here just yet. And then over in cursor, I'm just gonna fire off this API call. So I'm gonna hit node classify. It's gonna go across to NAN. It's gonna get the classification, which is technical. So everything worked in NAN, including the logging into my database. And here we have that log of that classification. So once again, you can get these classified by a human and then run them through the validation workflow. And that is our final production environment. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm gonna make all the resources available in my school community. So you can go across to there to keep chatting about this and learning about environments in NAN. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.